Hey tea heads, this is Don from Mayleaf. In this video, we're going to be diving into Hecha dark tea, and we're going to be taste testing the difference of a more famous dark tea called Ripe Pua or Shu Pua or Shou Pua, which I have here, versus Liu Bao, another very, very well known Hecha, but maybe one that you haven't heard of so often. So, what is Hecha? If you translate the Chinese, it literally translates to black tea. But because of the fact that in the West we have become so conditioned over the centuries to call black tea Hongcha, so Hongcha in China means red tea, and that's what the Chinese call the style of processing that leads to very oxidized tea, which we now in the West know as black tea. So there's been a sort of mistranslation. In China, it's called red tea, we've called it black tea. So rather than trying to rewrite all of that history, we translate Hecha to dark tea or post fermented tea. So Hongcha. In China, red tea has become translated to black tea in uh, in the West, and Hecha in China we call dark tea or post fermented tea. And this type of tea is defined by the fact that it must go through some sort of fermentation phase. So that fermentation phase means that there's some microbial activity that goes on that ferments the tea as well as oxidizes it. So it's not just fermentation. So there will be oxidation and fermentation, but that fermentation is a requirement in order for it to be called Hecha. And Hecha is actually a very, very old type of tea. It's one of the oldest types of teas out there. It certainly dates back to the Ming Dynasty. So, um, in uh, 1391 AD, the emperor in China decreed that cakes were no longer to be supplied to the royal households. And so loose tea, loose tea started to be produced. And this is where innovation started to kick in. And HR was certainly a product of that innovation. So it at least has about 500 to 600 years of history. But some people claim that it has longer history and that this type of fermented tea was going on many, many centuries before that but we can't be sure about that. But certainly it is one of the more ancient types of tea. And it comes from all sorts of provinces. So this uh, Liu Bao comes from Guangxi province, but there's very famous HR from Hunan province. So you get this Fu brick tea, for example, Fu Cha, which I just made a mess everywhere on my Gong Fu code. Um, so you've got that, you've got Sichuan uh, HR, you've got Hubei HR, you've got Anhui Hecha, so lots of different provinces produce Hecha, but it certainly is true that the predominance of its trade and its use is more in the western side of China in the border territories. This is why it's often called border style tea or border tea, where it is very, very popular. It is also very popular in parts of Malaysia and in Hong Kong, but I'll talk a little bit about that in a little while. So HR was being made in lots of different provinces as an ancient type of tea. Uh, ironically, the most popular or the most famous currently form of HR is with ripe pua tea, also known as shu pua or shou pua. And it's funny because this actually is the most recent variation of HR developed in the 1970s. Um, the other provinces were making them beforehand and uh, actually ripe pua borrowed a lot of the techniques from these other provinces. But it's funny because everyone sort of thinks of ripe pua as the most famous HR, but it's also the most recent. And what I want to focus on today is the taste difference between ripe Pua tea and another type of Hecha, which I absolutely love, called Liu Bao tea. Liu Bao is from Guangxi province. Let's talk a little bit about the history of Liu Bao tea. So Liu Bao literally translates to mean six castles or six forts because of the area, the village area of Liu Bao in Guangxi apparently used to have lots of forts. So it's called six fort tea, Liu Bao tea. And it is a very, very old tea. Again, 
at least, you know, three, four hundred years old, probably older than that. It really became popular in Malaysia in the uh, 19th century with the tin mining industry there. A lot of the workers were brought in from China and because of the conditions uh, mining tin, um, this tea is very, very well known in Chinese medicine for being, um, for being able to be both warming and uh, cooling and adapt to your body and also expel dampness. And um, so the workers supposedly in Malaysia brought in from China um, really relied upon this this Liu Bao tea to um, help them to cope with the conditions, the difficult conditions for tin mining. Um, and so Liu Bao became very, very popular in Malaysia. A lot of it moved over to Malaysia and a lot of the old um, Liu Bao tea still exists in Malaysia. It's also very, very popular in Hong Kong. Most hei cha is very, very well loved in the very hot and humid regions of China and in Hong Kong. So again, Liu Bao helps to expel dampness the way that Liu Bao is made has changed, as you would imagine, over the centuries. So originally it was made literally by steaming the tea. Um, so Liu Bao is an ancient form of uh, tea and ancient tea used to be steamed. So steaming was, was the more common way of uh, de-enzyming the tea or deactivating the enzymes that lead to oxidation in the tea to make green tea. So it's a steamed tea and the very, very primary ancient process for making Liu Bao supposedly was steaming the tea and literally just hanging the tea up wet and allowing it to essentially ferment um, in the natural environment. Then um, the production moved um, and changed to uh, sort of um, what they call double steaming, but is actually sort of triple steaming. So what they do is they steam the leaf um, to de-enzyme, then they steam the leaf again um, to compress it into uh, boxes, um, and those boxes are left um, to allow the tea to ferment. And then um, the tea is then taken and steamed one more time to compress it into baskets. And Liu Bao tea is uh, traditionally um, purchased in baskets. So it's a, called basket tea. You may hear um, people talk about basket tea. So Liu Bao is compressed into baskets and then the tea is allowed to continue to age and ferment. Don't forget that every time they're steaming it, they're adding more moisture to the leaf. That's gonna sort of reinvigorate all of the sort of microbial action and allow that fermentation to continue. Um, and obviously if it's stored in a, in a warm and humid environment, then over the years that will continue to age and ferment and turn the leaf darker. But you can see that this um, style of uh, processing does not involve heavy piling, which is the process which is used nowadays to make ripe pu'er. So these older processes for making Liu Bao called double steaming method or triple steaming method, doesn't involve that piling uh, process. And so you get a more light fermentation. So you're, you're um, adding moisture and you are definitely contributing to the fermentation phase, but you're also allowing the years to do a lot of the work. Um, from the 1960s onwards, Liu Bao started to um, incorporate more of a piling process, but again, still light piling. So they wouldn't put much water, they wouldn't um, pile the leaf too high. So this piling process was developed and used from the 60s in certain Liu Bao productions. And that technique started to be exported to uh, Yunnan um, and so developed uh, the style of making ripe Pu'er tea in Yunnan province, um, and then the styles adapt to the environment, adapt to the leaves, adapt to the microorganisms, and Yunnan started to develop their own sort of styles of piling where it became you know, deeper piles, thicker piles, and, and putting more and more water over the leaves to get a richer, deeper fermentation. Now, this is a matter of preference. Some people like a more lightly fermented uh, HR. Some people prefer a darker fermented HR. But oftentimes you now see uh, Liu Bao, you know, modern Liu Bao, imitating a little bit more the Yunnan style, so making very, very dark teas. So let's quickly scope both of these teas. Both of these teas are new in stock. This one here is 
autumn light. This is a spring 2013 Pua from the Daiyejong variety from Bulang, Yunnan in China. Uh, picking is going to be sort of bud and, uh, and young leaves and the uh, elevations around 1,500 meters. The Liu Bao over here, this is from spring 2019. So only a year old. I'm speaking to you from 2020 um, and really goes to show actually that there must be very different styles in how the fermentation happens because normally you wouldn't be purchasing ripened pua tea that's only a year old um, you know in terms of purchasing it for sale you might purchase it but you'd be storing it to allow it to sort of breathe a bit but um, clearly the fermentation has been done um, differently because this 2019 is clean as a whistle in terms of its taste. Um, so spring 2019, the cultivar is the Guangxi Daiyejong. So it is gonna be part of the big leaf variety, which is just sort of a very, very broad category of tea, but it's the ones that are more native to Guangxi, which from my, um, uh, from what I've seen is slightly smaller leaf than the one from Yunnan province. The origin of this is from Wuzhou in Guangxi in China. If you've never been to Guangxi, it's one of my most loved provinces in terms of the picturesque nature of that area. It's so beautiful. Go check out pictures online of Guangxi. Type in Guangxi province or Guilin and you'll see some incredible imagery. Uh, the picking and processing. This is using the Wodoi, so the, the, the pile fermentation. So similar to uh, this one here, but clearly, as I said, is being done slightly differently to produce different results. And the elevation is around 1,000 to 1,500 meters. Picking on this will be very, very similar, a bud and young leaves budding up to sort of three leaves. Let's take a look at the difference in color. Uh, this one looks a little bit more red overall in color compared to the Liu Bao. Picking looks very, very similar sort of um, uh, coarse, fine to coarse picking, um, but that's what you'd expect for these types of loose ripened teas. Very, very, very affordable teas. And I will say, as a little teaser, we do have some very old Liu Bao. I'm going to be making a video very shortly about that. It'll be a 1970s and a 1980s Liu Bao, but I wanted to first dive into the difference of modern Liu Bao 2013 Ripua versus a 2019 Liu Bao tea. I've got my Gen Shui pots here. So let's warm them up. I'm so excited that we have finally got some Liu Bao here. I mean, we've been wanting to get other types of HR apart from Ripua for a while. And Liu Bao has always been top of my list. Don't get me wrong. I drink other types of HR as well, but if there was any HR that I pick out of my private collection the most, apart from Ripe Pua, it's Liu Bao tea. Liu Bao, I, I just think it has such a, a beautiful, remarkable uh, character. So, warm the cups up as well. And then let's get these leaves into these hot Gen Shui pots. If you're watching at the time of the release, hopefully our new Gen Shui pots will be in. Everything is becoming a bit delayed with shipping. Uh, it's causing a bit of stress. Um, but you know, when you see this, hopefully our new Gen Shui pots are in. Go check it out. So this is Autumn Light, Bulang, Ripe Pua. And this is our 2019 Liu Bao. Let's try to give you some snapshots of the differences between them. Here we go. Rich, um, slightly uh, bready, like walnut bread. Uh, uh, a little bit of um, oak, some vanilla, um, uh, um, leather, just, just straight ahead everything you want from oak, uh, uh, a balanced ripened puerti. 
it's got a bit of creaminess, it's got a bit of woodiness, it's got a bit of earthiness, it's got a bit of cavernous sort of quality. It has none of the funky, fishy aroma at all. And um, it's also got a slight nutty, bready note. So excellently fermented, excellently um, stored, ripe, poor. Right, Liu Bao time. Just very, um, a little bit more uh, acidity on the nose, a little bit more fruitiness on the nose. It's still bready, but the breads are more like, you know, those sort of breads that you get, which are a little bit more like straight ahead grain breads, like um, um, those sort of German rye breads. I'm getting um, a, a sort of vitamin uh, C, uh, goji berry, acerola berry um, fruitiness, sort of a, a um, yeah, a slight sort of acidity to it, a fruity acidity to it. Um, yeah, soda bread. That's what it is. Soda bread, so very dense, deep bread, but then with those high notes that come, those sort of quite zesty, orangey, berry, goji berries, acerola cherries, acerola, you know, very sort of in that sort of vitamin C um, acidity. Very different. Both delightful. Let's rinse them both. Okay. Here we go. Autumn light. Ooh. Mmm. Brazil nuts. Um, slight, slightly angelica, Chinese medicine angelica. A little bit of varnished um, antique woods. Still that walnut bread is there. Very, very, um, very, very upfront smell. That walnut bread, really delicious. But but very complicated, sort of a little bit medicinal, very, very bready, a little bit nutty. And the um, varnished wood is a, is a really um, like walking into a sort of a library, um, that sort of note. Right, very excited to smell the uh, wet leaf of Liu Bao. Oh, it's just so bright. Um, like tangerine, tangerine, I don't know if this exists, but like tangerine um, hard boiled sweets, a little bit caramelly with that tangerine. I am getting some varnished wood, but it's different. It's more like a, a instead of an antique, um, or instead of a library you're walking into, you're more like you're walking into a, a woodworking um, shop, you know, where you're, you're getting this sort of more freshly cut woods, a little bit of that fresh lacquer smell. And it definitely still has a, uh, a bready note, but again, lighter, less of that um, walnut bread, more, more like a, a dough that's rising. So like rising dough smell, that sort of um, comforting smell of dough rising. Um, and that tangerine, like uh, almost like um, taking tangerine um, skin and allowing it to sort of age a bit, but not that medicinal, more sort of like it just concentrates the sugars in that zest. So it's sort of a sweet tangerine zestiness, incredible smell and totally different, more sort of antiques, clays, earthy, you know, um, nutty, foresty. This one is much more bright. 
very, very zesty and bright on the nose with more like new woods um, workshops, like uh, that new lacquer and, uh, and tangerine zestiness. And obviously they are six years apart, but overall I hope that those of you who have had a lot of Liu Bao would agree that tends to be that Liu Bao is uh, on the lighter side, you can still get very dark Liu Baos, but on the lighter side in comparison to Right Pua, probably a bit too much of a generalization, but overall it tends to be weighted in that area. Now people often talk about uh, betel nuts being the very kind of archetypal taste of Liu Bao. Um, I haven't um, chewed enough betel nuts to really know I've, I've had it but like I didn't store it in my uh, in my um, memory of uh, memory bank of flavors enough but I can sort of um, note generally there's a sort of uh, a nutty slightly medicinal nutty note happening with a lot of Liu Bao teas okay uh, we'll just go straight Autumn light, I should say, is also quite a lightly fermented ripe pu'er. Certainly a lot lighter, as you can see, compared to like black Yunnan tour tea. So, you know, it is, we are comparing a light ripe pu'er with a Liu Bao. Let's check out the color difference. Despite the lighter smell of the Liu Bao, the liquor is definitely darker. Here you go. Autumn light has more of that ready tone to it, more sort of orangey in terms of tone. If you would sort of shown me these liquors and based on smell, you would say that one would be the one that smelt lighter, but it's actually the other way around. But again, um, if you see it with the light going through, they are both pretty light compared with a lot of ripe teas. Okay, let's put these to the side, giving myself a little bit more space. And now let's taste them. So autumn light, Bulang ripe pu'er. Next to, I'm not gonna say versus because it's not a competition, but next to our 2019 Liu Bao. Let's go with the ripe pu'er first. Texture is medium and the taste is already sweet. I'm getting Brazil nuts. Like sweet adzuki, is it adzuki? But like, you know, those sweet bean, red bean paste that are often used um, to um, in desserts in, in Asia. Sweet red beans. There is a slight sort of um, oranginess to it as well. So there is some sort of, a, there is a bit of that fruitiness happening. Hmm. Very, very sweet finish. Has more of that um, orange peel note. Mm. Yeah. Sweet beans, um, Brazil nuts, walnuts. The earthiness is there, but earthy is sort of a very vague term. It's not like pungent earthy. It's sort of just like a, a nutty earthiness to it. With like a very sweet, not zest, not orange zest, but like sweet, like if, if you've taken sort of orange essential oil, you know, that sweet orange oil and just sort of dropped tiny, tiny little bit in there, just sort of like um, giving it a little spritzing of that. That's the taste. A lovely, lovely tea, light, bright, sweet, but still comforting. Okay, let's dive into the Liu Bao. Mm. The acidity on it, when I say acidity, I don't mean the sourness. I mean the sort of uh, a liveliness that comes from. It reminds me of like 
that acerola cherries or rose hip, those sorts of notes. It's similar sort of texture in terms of the uh, viscosity as the ripe pu'er, but definitely a lot more quenching and refreshing um, on the finish. Like it just has more of a refreshing mouthfeel rather than a rounded mouthfeel um, that the autumn light does. Um, and the, the, the taste is... So there are some similarities. I would say that you're getting Brazil nuts in both. You're getting breadiness in both, but this again is more like a walnut bread or a standard sort of loaf. This one here is more of that rye bread, you know, seed grain bread that you get um, in um, parts of sort of Germany and Scandinavia. And you're getting that rose hip, tangerine, very, very, um, and afterwards through the nose, it has almost a little bit of a, um, cooling, not really mentholated, but cooling like uh, um, citrus, like pomelo zesty, sweet zestiness. Very cooling um, in the mouth. And I have to say, Liu Bao, I think more than any other tea that I can think of right now is is the tea that I go to when I'm feeling like I need, like if you're feeling like the damp is in you or like, you know, you feel like shivery and cold and you just want um, something that is gonna be gently warming and restorative. It has a very sort of calm, medic calm but potent medicinal feel to it. It feels very, very settled. You're not gonna get any rushiness coming through with Liu Bao. Um, it's gonna, warm you up when you need warming. It's gonna cool you down when you need cooling. It's like an adaptogenic tea for me, Liu Bao. I love Liu Bao for that restorative effect. And it has definitely that cooling note in uh, the mouth and down the airways. Mm. This is a more sweet, comforting, nutty, bready um, brew. And the finish on this one, I need to drink a few more sips just to sort of make sure I'm getting the finish predominantly from this and not the Liu Bao. Mm. It is cooling, but the sweetness is, um, the cooling is less pronounced and it's the sweetness is more like a floral jasmine, jasmine like floral sweetness. So this is more of a sort of pomelo, grapefruit, zesty sweetness. This one has more of a sort of uh, floral, flowery um, sweetness, but they're both cooling. The Liu Bao is more cooling though. Mm. Wow, back to back. It's a really lovely sort of interplay between them. This has a little bit more of a complex sort of, um, again, I, I wanna say sort of, um, oh, you know those um, fruit bars that you get, like sort of energy fruit bars that like compressed fruit. It has that sort of note to it. Um, sort of dried fruits, but very sort of um, vitamin rich dried fruits, sort of compressed into those uh, little uh, strips that you eat. It also has a little, slight, very, very delicate sort of um, wine note to it. Um, so you're getting a little bit more of that sort of fermented. It doesn't taste alcoholic, but it has sort of a wine star sort of tang to it a little bit, just, just a remnant um, when you swallow. This one is a lot more sweet and Husky and more of that classic ripe pu'er, albeit a lighter version. We'll brew one more infusion, um, but I want to have a sniff of the empty Gongdao Bays. Just put the temperature up. I'm brewing with boiling water. 
Okay, let's have a sniff. Wow. <laughs> okay, uh, I was gonna say brown bread, but very, very dark um, baked brown bread. Almost like a malt, malted brown bread. And there's um, a distinct sort of, like slightly resinous, tarry quality to it. Like, um, like hot, like if you know, you sort of uh, drive past roadworks and you get that smell of sort of asphalt, you know, which, you know, in small doses is actually a really quite uh, engaging smell. So yeah, I would say asphalt and soda bread or brown bread. Okay, let's smell the Lubao. Wow. Interestingly, this has more of a caramel note to it, more of a, um, again, that dried fruit note. It really reminds me of acerola cherries or goji berries. Like if you smell dry goji berries, really, really is there. The lovely feeling that I'm having in my body right now, warming but cooling at the same time. That's why it's so loved. Uh, these types of teas are so loved in hot weather countries, um, places like Hong Kong, places like Malaysia, where it's hot and humid. These types of HR are just lifesavers in those areas and why they're so popular and people love them so much. And it's such widely consumed tea. I remember, you know, my father used to always, when I was a little kid, he always used to order, um, you know, ripened tea whenever we'd go out to a, a Chinese restaurant. And I, as a kid, I was always like, why? I just want jasmine. I just want green teas or jasmine. Every time he would order um, the dark teas. Um, but now I just, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm totally on board. I love these types of teas. Certainly I would pick these types of teas over um, those lighter teas, especially with food for sure. You would definitely want to uh, have these kinds of ultra digestive teas. The color of autumn light, the way that it shines and the reason why we call it autumn light, the liquor is just luminous and you don't really, uh, it doesn't really do it justice through this camera because all the lights are shining towards me. So I'm seeing all of the light shining through this liquor. It is, you're gonna have to trust me. If you, if you pick up a pack of autumn light, you will know it is just the clearest, most luminous ripe pour that I've ever uh, encountered. The Liu Bao is darker again. Flavor profile is the same. More of that sugary sweetness is coming through. Mm. And again, that, that little kick of um, vitamin C-like acerola, dried fruits, goji berries is just delicious. The Brazil nuts are coming through. I'm getting that what I imagine a betel nut to sort of taste like from my recollections of when I did chew betel nuts um, in uh, China. Um, but um, I noticed that th that flavor profile is more pronounced in the older Liu Bao teas. And as I said, we have a couple of really old Liu Bao teas. I'm gonna be doing a tasting with Celine. So if you're interested in finding out how the older Liu Bao teas stack up against this 2019, then uh, make sure you tune in for that one. This is a fascinating comparison and they're both very, very affordable teas. So um, I highly recommend that you pick them up and do this back to back yourself to compare the difference between Ripe Pua and Liu Bao. Obviously there are endless varieties and makes of Ripe Pua and lots of different Liu Bao. So it's almost impossible to create sort of definitive um, differences in terms of taste, but this is a great one to do. Two lightly fermented HRs, both exhibiting the characteristics of their particular terroir and tradition. That's it, tea heads. Check out our other videos, taste our teas wherever you are in the world by browsing mayleaf.com and come visit us if you're ever in London. Other than that, I'm Don from Mayleaf. Thank you for being a part of the revelation of true tea. Stay away from those tea bags. Keep drinking the good stuff and spread the word because nobody deserves bad tea. Bye.